าเชิญนั่งค่ะคริสตีพิเศษในเช้าวันนี้เรามีความยินดีที่จะได้ฟังพระคำเทศนาจากศาสนาจารย์ปีเตอร์แทนกาชวย Reverend Peter Tan is a nominee for FTPC pastor position. We will hear his sermon this morning. Welcome. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you also for the hospitality and kindness you've extended my wife and I, uh, especially yesterday and uh, all throughout the weekend. Uh, we certainly appreciate it, and we feel very blessed. I heard a Presbyterian pastor once say that it is hard and awkward to do a pastor candidate sermon. He said that it is awkward because people are not really listening carefully to what the pastor has to say. He claims that what people are mostly doing is checking the pastor out. They are evaluating how the pastor looks. The pastor's tone and voice, the pastor's mannerism in the pulpit, even perhaps what the pastor is wearing, the pastor's overall disposition and demeanor. Perhaps maybe some people are listening and they're wondering if the pastor is funny, uh, because some may want a preacher who's funny, or they're wondering if the pastor is not funny, since some don't really want humor in a sermon. They may wonder if the pastor gives good stories, or if he is someone who just sticks to what's in the text. In other words, for this particular Presbyterian pastor, a pastor candidate sermon is awkward because the sermon is not about the content of the sermon anymore, but instead it becomes more about the pastor and the expectations of what they think a pastor should be. Now, in some sense, I think it is natural to do that especially if a church is about to consider calling a pastor candidate and they don't know the candidate very well. But I do disagree when he said that no one pays attention to the content or the message. I think that for all of us, I think that for all of you here at First Thai Presbyterian Church and for many other churches, the message of any sermon, regardless of whether it's a candidate sermon or a sermon in an ordinary Sunday, the content or the message of any sermon matters. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to hear your word. By your spirit, may today's message draw us closer to you and lead us to follow your will and your way. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul was faced with a crisis. Actually, he was faced with several problems with his congregation in Corinth. This was a congregation he founded sometime between 50 and 52 AD during his second missionary journey. He stayed with them for about a year and a half, according to Acts 18. He left Corinth after that, and other preachers, such as Apollos, came to disciple them. He wrote 1 Corinthians because of reports of disagreements within his congregation. What we learn in the earlier part of chapter 1 is that the church members, they were in disagreement on several issues. One issue was that they formed rivalries or quarrels about their preferences on who they want to follow as their preacher or pastor. In terms of the big picture, what you all need to know about the background of the church is that the members of this church are simply behaving in the ways of the culture of the Greco-Roman world in the first century. Now, just to give you a very quick background, uh, there was extensive history made and research on Corinth beginning the 19th century in the areas of the sciences like archaeology, literary sources, inscriptions, and the like. And ancient Corinth, which you may know is located in modern-day Greece, was destroyed and then rebuilt as a Roman colony sometime in 44 BC. It had Roman architecture, Roman form of government, and it was the capital city of the region instead of Athens. It was a city with a thriving economy with an international port that links the Mediterranean from the east to the west. Every two years, it hosted the Isthmian Games, which is second in prominence to the Olympic Games. 
It was the first Greek city to have Roman gladiator contests. It had a diverse population. It was made up of Roman veterans, Greeks who were Romanized, Jews, freedmen, slaves, resident aliens, the poor, and the up-and-coming rich. The people, of course, had many religious uh, diversity and philosophies. They have different temples of different idols like Aphrodite, Apollo, and the temple of Asclepius. In terms of attitude, the Corinthians looked at themselves as culturally Roman since it was built as a Roman city, although it's Greek. They had a high sense of pride. This was a city where someone or people can be socially ambitious and climb up the ladder of society and become rich and powerful. Uh, in a sense, it has some similarities with the city of Los Angeles. LA has this uh, diversity and uh, many different types of people, many religions and philosophies. It has this socially ambitious, social climbing people who want to be rich or famous. Uh, maybe that's why they call LA the city of dreams. Uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, Kentucky, where I was from, uh, they just say, just go to LA and your dreams can come true. Uh, going back to Corinth, there were many people in the first century uh, some people actually, known as uh, the sophists. The word sophists come from the Greek word sophia, which means wise. They were people who can supposedly make other people wise. They traveled widely and, and acted as instructors. They gave public lectures to demonstrate their public speaking skills and to get business. The more successful ones were known for their elegance in public speaking and reasoning. And during this time, there was much importance in Corinth given to people who could speak elegantly and eloquently. And the people in Corinth with a social climbing mindset tended to get boastful and competitive about whom they want to follow. They tend to put down the teacher of another person and elevate their own. They tended to like people who speak well or are eloquent and are <coughs> persuasive, especially since people who are gifted in speaking were, well, they were considered wise. So the consensus nowadays is that the problem in the Corinthian church is that people are simply behaving in the way that they were taught by the culture and the world they lived in. In other words, they were behaving in a worldly manner. They wanted worldly wisdom and admired people with worldly wisdom. Um, so you can see that is what Paul was up against. It was a congregation following what Paul would call the wisdom of the world. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the problem was that the church was quarreling and boasting over who they prefer as their pastor or preacher. Some said, I follow Paul. Others said, I follow Apollos. Or, I follow Cephas. In other words, they were saying, my preacher or pastor is better than yours. So, let's take a look at Paul's response. For Paul, it was not about who can speak better or who has better worldly wisdom. It was not about the person, but it was the message that was more important. What Paul is saying is that it is the content or message of the cross that really matters. Let's take a look again at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Paul says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So here, Paul talks about the message of the cross. He actually says there's two kinds of people, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. In Paul's time, there were Jews and Greeks, Romans, freedmen, slaves, the poor. Here in LA, there's different ethnic groups, Hispanic, Thai, Chinese, Filipino, Korean, African American, and others people from different generations and classes, different religions. But in reality, Paul says there are just two kinds of people, the ones who are perishing and the ones who are being saved. For one type of person, those who are perishing, which means the ones who do not trust God and are separated from God, the message of the cross is nonsense or it's just foolishness. For them, the cross is a Roman punishment. It is a picture of shame, rejection, and humiliation. 
For those who are being saved, which means those who trust and believe our Lord Jesus Christ, the message of the cross means something else. It is the power of God working in them. The next few verses will explain what these all mean. Let's go to verse 19. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This is an example of how Paul supports what he said with Scripture. Paul uses Isaiah 29, 14 to say that God is pronouncing judgment on those who simply live by worldly wisdom. And this judgment comes especially when God is all set to do amazing things with his people, meaning when God sends the Savior or Messiah. Let's go to verse 20 and 21. It says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. Paul says that without the message of the cross, the people of the world did not really know God. Worldly wisdom does not tell us who God is, although it may give us an idea that there is a God, but it does not tell us specifically about Christ. When you look at the world and nature and the order of the earth and the universe, you can tell that there must have been a divine maker. But that does not tell you who God is. That does not tell you what the love of God looks like. But when we preach the cross, people get to know who God really is. For the ones who put their faith and trust in Christ, the cross is what saves them and gives them eternal life with God. The cross tells us that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He died for our sins so that the ones who put their trust and faith in Him will have eternal life with God. Uh, because of our sins, we really don't deserve life. Uh, we really don't deserve to be with a holy and blameless God. Because of our sins, what we really deserve is eternal punishment. For the wages of sin is death. But Christ, because of what he did on the cross, paid the price that we should have paid on our behalf. And why did he do this? Why would God send his son to die on our behalf? It is because, as we all know, God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Billy Graham says it best when he said, the cross is the expression of God's love for us. I say it is the highest expression of God's love for us. Let's go to verse 22 to 23. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Again, Paul gives us two groups who think that the cross is offensive. For the first group, the Jews, they want dramatic signs that confirm whatever Jesus says. For them, a Messiah that is crucified is not a good sign, but it is a man who is cursed, according to Deuteronomy 21:23. They could not ever believe that the Messiah could be crucified. For the second group, the Greeks or Gentiles, they could not figure out why someone who was killed and punished by the Romans could be the savior of the world. If you think about it, why would people today believe? To a lot of people who are not Christian, the cross is something you just put on your necklace or hang on the wall. For some, the cross is just a symbol of a, or a tattoo behind your neck or in some other place. For others, the cross is just another remnant of an old-fashioned traditional belief or something that belongs in old medieval churches. For some from a different religion or background, it is a sign of an infidel crusader or it could be a sign that Jesus had bad karma. But for many others, the cross is offensive because 
it is a sign of judgment. The cross tells people that they have committed sins. The cross demands from people a change in lifestyle. Now that would be very offensive. Finally, let's go to verses 24 to 25. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. For people who are touched by the Spirit of God and are convicted by the Spirit of God, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what nationality or social status or age. The cross of Christ took away all our sins. We all know that we didn't become Christians through our own power or our own wisdom. We could not take away our own sins. We could not live a Christian life on our own power or our own thinking. Last week, uh, when I was at work at the hospital I work at at St. Joseph's Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, there was a family member of a patient who just died, um, and this family member asked me a question. Uh, he said, do you know if you're going to heaven? And well, that wasn't a new question for me. Sometimes I do get questions like that because uh, families want to check and see if I was a Christian chaplain because some other chaplains could be from a different faith tradition. So I said, yes, yes, I know I'm going to heaven. And I also added, I know it wasn't because of me. It's not because of my own power or my own ability. I know I didn't earn it. Christ paid the price 2,000 years ago so that my sins are forgiven. And I don't even have the power to handle my own sins, so I certainly wouldn't have the power to handle everybody's sins. This passage in uh, 1 Corinthians is what I preached on for my preaching class at Fuller Seminary uh, sometime in 2002. Uh, in that preaching class, we learned about the theology of preaching, styles, techniques, rhetoric, other practical issues. Back then, I was so worried about my presentation, how I look, my voice, and other things. But this passage in 1 Corinthians helped me realize and focus on what's really the most important. And what's most important is not technique, rhetoric, good illustrations. And not that those are not important at all, because you do need skills and gifts in these things to make preaching authentic and relatable. But the most important thing, the focus of the preacher, what really has the power of God and it really transforms people, is Jesus Christ. Especially what he did for us on the cross and what Christ is continuing to do for us today through the power of the Holy Spirit. The focus of the preacher is not on himself, but it is on Christ Jesus, the power and wisdom of God. I'm sure for a few days now or a week, I'm not really sure, you know, a lot of you may have heard or read a little bit about me, my background, education, training, ministry. Um, you've learned about my wife, and you maybe read about what we wrote for the congregation. Um, it's been good getting to know some of you, especially yesterday, and we look forward to getting to know more of you today. But also through this message, uh, hopefully this can inform you a little bit more about my ministry, the fact that it is about Jesus Christ, uh, and that regardless of my qualifications, my background, education, my training as a Presbyterian minister, whoever I am, where I stand in ministry is that it is informed by God through Jesus Christ, informed by the Word of God, and moving as best as it can uh, into the leading of the Holy Spirit. As you all probably know, I'm not a son of a preacher or pastor. I didn't come from a family of great Christian leaders. I did not grow up on fire for Jesus or in the ways of Scripture. There was a time I was living by the ways and wisdom of the world and I didn't think there was anything wrong about it. I was 30 years old when I really heard the gospel, and that's when I really heard the gospel. That was in 97, and that's 18 years ago, so you don't have to do the math. 
Um, I had a Christian friend who told me about Jesus, and this friend of mine displayed the love of Jesus to everyone and was not afraid to talk to people about Jesus. Then, in God's timing, my friend told me about Jesus and explained to me the scriptures that spoke about the good news. I even received music with lyrics that talked about the cross of Christ and how Jesus died for my sins. At that point in my life, I was gradually becoming more and more aware about my failings and my sins and how everything I have been doing was wrong. And it happened one night um, many years ago. It was actually a very stormy night in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I can't explain how, I can't explain why, but suddenly everything started clicking. It started to make some sense. I became aware that I was a sinner and I was on the wrong path and I was doing the wrong things. And I realized that Jesus actually put his life on the line and literally died to save me. I felt very sorry and remorseful uh, for what I did with my life, what I've been doing. And it was hard to sleep because there was a major thunderstorm and it was really loud and I couldn't stop thinking about what Jesus did for me. I woke up the next morning and through the Holy Spirit, I woke up with some sense of forgiveness and freedom. And that mo morning, I responded to the gospel and gave my life to Christ. Sunday came and I went to my friend's church. And in reality, this was a church I visited only a few weeks before because my friend brought me there. Um, it was kind of a big church uh, in St. Paul. I was probably one of only five Asian guys in a crowd of 2,000. Uh, during my visit, I enjoyed it because I liked the music. The pastor was passionate, engaging, and full of energy, although I